Good morning, it is day two and I am almost ready to call my Uber for, so I can get, for so I can get myself, what? So I can get myself over to the venue for Autism at Work. Um, because my hotel, it's not at a hotel. So lots and lots of Uber on this trip. Um, yesterday was really, really great. Uh, there was a reception slash happy hour, which normally I dread these kind of things, and I was dreading it a little bit. But once I went and actually sat down, it was the easiest networking and reception night I've ever been to, because here people recognize me and know who I am, uh, which means I don't have to make a lot of effort to go up and talk to strangers. Uh, because they come up and talk to me, which is making it so much easier. And this is how I'm standing while I talk on the phone. Foot holding stem. So anyway, I'm just sitting talk like this now. Uh, not really. I need to finish getting ready and I need to get out the door and I need to go do the things. Um, and hopefully my phone won't die again. This hotel is weird and there is no cell phone signal in the lobby, in the halls. I have a weak cell phone signal the minute I walk into my room it pops up. Um, but there's no signal in the venue either. I have no signal. So, I don't know what's with that. But anyway, I gotta finish getting ready and I gotta head out and I gotta go. I hope my phone doesn't die. I mean, to just put it in airplane mode or something. Because the no signal thing is like eating my battery really, really fast. And I want to be able to like record and show you things. So, uh, we'll see. Anyway, there we go. And then after that, we're going to have the breakout session. So think about the panel that Dr. Jayaraman will be running as a way for you to select where you want to go to the breakout sessions. The breakout session. hope that you enjoy the, the rest of the day. Uh, again, we started with a great, great energy yesterday. You know? When we look at this whole world that we're talking about, we want to make sure that we're following the advice and, and the guidance from the people who we're actually working with together on these programs. And, and these people here are going to offer some of that to all of you. I know for me, one of the things that I, I continue to try to use as a mantra in the work that we do uh, is a, a quote by Maya Angelou that I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. And I think that that is really important to, to think about, especially as we are all interested in this topic, autism at work, neurodiversity in the workplace. We really want to make sure that we're still serving the population that we're serving um, and creating this inclusive culture together. So um, I think I kind of have two different answers, one kind of on the <coughs> employer side and one on the employee side. Uh, once Simple thing is, if you're applying to a company that has an autism at work pro program, it doesn't feel very awkward to disclose that you're autistic for it. Um, huh. On the employee side, I think it's a tough issue, um, like kind of when and how much to disclose. But I think one important factor is the consideration of, you know, you can apply for a position disclosing you're autistic or not, but you can't apply to a position being autistic or not. And, you know, it's a judgment call, but if you feel that, well, they might not, I'm bad at interviews, they might not hire me because um, I'm bad at interviews, I don't speak well, I don't make eye contact. Well, those are situations I think disclosing can help. Um, <laughs> because it provides a reason and it provides kind of a window for you know, the person giving the interview to kind of see past, well, normally maybe this would be a behavior that we reject someone for, but there's, maybe there's actually a reason for it and maybe we shouldn't turn this person away. Hi, um, so I'm a senior leader at, uh, at Capital One and I'm about to launch a neurodiversity program there and I am autistic, and I'm gonna launch it by coming out. And I'm wondering, like, <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you, any of you could speak to, you know, whether it is important for you to see leaders um, in your company, managers, coming out themselves. And I know John Elder Robinson made a very impassioned plea to like parents mm -hmm. who might have neurodiverse traits themselves, who might be in leadership positions to also come out. Um, this seemed like a kind of a missing thing from this whole discussion. I'd love to get your perspective. Mm. 
when you bring employees into your workplace and you say we have an autism at work program and that's like who these employees are and they're you know they're openly autistic people may be accepting and they may think they're being inclusive but they will always see these group of people as an other and when you say i've always been here and i've been one of your leaders and hey i was on the spectrum the whole time i mean that, those are the moments when you see people have this paradigm shift in their head of like uh oh this is not some special other these people are just like people i know and care about and we're capable of being leaders so empathy I just wanted to really encourage that kind of thought because people like me who, you know, I used to be working in jobs where I was underemployed or unemployed and I had big dreams and I still do about one day having my own business. And I always looked up and around to say, hey, how many people like me have mm -hmm. been leaders of some kind of company? How many people like me have been successful? And you should really just know in your heart that you're inspiring the masses when you do that. And People just like you are just being so inspired. And just as a side note, I wanted to touch on the other question real quick. I, w I just wanted other people with autism to know that I have this little trick of the trade. When I really want to learn a new job skill, I like to look at it as a science. Because, I don't know, many of us are very scientifically minded, or we like to look at it as a field of study. And if it can fit into our field of study, then we can just learn it just like that. And when I first learned how to socialize, I mm. graphed it out as in probability and statistics. And I could graph out people's reactions to all sorts of different stimuli. And if I learned being social like it was a study, and I read all the books on speaking, and I read all the books on socializing, mm. and I graphed out, and I ran experiments about how people ran <laughs> Yes. Learn anything. Yes. Many of you in autism at work and in disability services uh, today um, are accustomed to a model where someone like I or my son would um, would receive some kind of disability support uh, or even receive social security disability if we felt ourselves unable to work. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, if you could walk and you could talk, you could have a job. That was the thought in America. The idea that somebody like me would receive a benefit from the government at not work, it just wasn't there for me. Um, and uh, so I, um, I left home at an early age and I joined a band because it was what I could do. Um, I, I worked in, um, in music, I worked in electrical engineering. Um, in uh, 1982, I found myself uh, laid off, and that was the one time in my life that I did apply for government benefits, and um, I got $190 a week unemployment, and I thought to myself, this is bullshit, you know, I'm not going to do this. And I flew to Georgia, and I bought an old Porsche, and I drove it home, and I sold it, and I made a couple thousand dollars on it, and I said, that's the thing. so I... Uh, started buying and selling um, old, um, old European cars. And even when I got a job, I continued doing that. And um, I finally concluded in the uh, late 1980s that I, I just couldn't fit in in the workplaces. I felt like I had failed. And today I realize it's because of autism and I couldn't understand the social dynamics at work. Um, and, and I think today things might be different. I think in the culture of like an SAP or Dell or Ernst & Young, I, I think that, that actually those companies would, would welcome me and I, I could stay. Um, ironically, you know, one of the companies I left, Milton Bradley, a toy maker, um, years later, you know, when they did a TV show about that time in my life, and the president of Milton Bradley said I was one of their best engineers and I quit Milton Bradley because I thought I was a failure and I was on the brink of getting fired. And that really illustrates the invisible disability of this and how I could misunderstand the situation. But be that as it may, I quit and I decided to go on my own and start a business fixing cars. And, um, and I cannot stress how um, valuable the skills in operating a business like that are to a neurodivergent person with a social disability. 
because if you have a hard time talking to people, um, you have a hard time knowing what to say, you don't have any choice if you own a business. Before I started the business, I had gotten me a wife, and, and by that time, I had gotten a kid. The kid grew up, and he's standing back there in the back. Um, but at the time, the kid had to be fed. And, uh, and there was absolutely no question that I had to operate a business successfully. So even if I was uncomfortable with social situation, I didn't know what to say, I had to learn how to communicate successfully to build that business. And, um, and it has grown. Um, we, we grew our business, we bought the building we were in, we bought the surrounding buildings, we, you know, we now are, you know, we have all these affiliated uh, tenants and businesses that we're part of in our complex, which collectively, you know, probably employ a good many people, close to 100. Um, and um, that, uh, that to me is a model for a neurodivergent employment and accommodation, just as you heard from John and Karen this morning. Um, people, uh, people come to our workplace because they feel that uh, we are accommodating of people who are different. Our clients come to us because they feel that we are different and we do a better job. And, um, and I think that that's really important. Um, but it is absolutely clear to me that this kind of tolerance often carries a cost. I have to tolerate people who, who break things, do things, they do, say and do weird things. And, you know, and if I was only focused on profit, I might just throw them out. But I don't do that because I believe in it. And, and people recognize that. And that is absolutely critical that the leader of the organization and everyone below have to follow that, that model. And, and then, of course, I, I advise um, other organizations. I've been involved with um, IAC, who produces a strategic plan for autism for our country for the last eight years. I'm now also advising our Department of Energy's National Labs on neurodiversity. And, uh, and I teach neurodiversity at um, William and Mary and Landmark Colleges. And, and in both places, with respect to work, I teach the idea that we need to be self-sufficient individuals. We need to not be reliant on governments, disability supports, but we need to go out in the workplace, and we need to kick ass and make our own way, and we need to not just be there, we need to be stars. And every one of us can be a star. I don't mean that we're gonna be brilliant innovators, I mean that we can be the guy everyone counts on in the maintenance department. We can be the guy who personally planted 3,600 mums and pots for the Eastern States Exposition, just as well as we can be the guy that invented the next piece of hardware or software for a tech company like yours. We have to believe in that, we need to go out and do it. And, and that's gonna, you know, that's a long road to get us there, but that's what I'm committed to. All right, it's time for lunch, so here am I. Better late than never. Get something to eat. Or we go back in for more education. Oh, no, no, no. I just. Lunch was delicious. I'm pretty sure it was Chipotle, which is hard to get wrong. Or knock off Chipotle, either way, it was awesome. Um, now I'm gonna head inside and enjoy more education about neurodiversity in the workplace because that is the call that we're putting out, not autism at work, neurodiversity at work. And this carries my stamp of approval for sure. <laughs> so we're going to ask that you guys, please make sure that you stay awake um, and that you give our speakers your undivided attention. So if you were here on, and again, what I want to make sure that we are doing is attempt to be inclusive, is make sure that our applause look like this and less more of the action so that we are respectful of those who may have some sensory um, concerns and some opportunity there. So let's just practice. Can we do that? Let's give that up for Dr. Stephen Schur as he comes. We are hearing about uh, people on the autism spectrum and the demand to want to know how to make sure that there are opportunities for young people and adults with on, on the autism spe spectrum in our companies. 
and we need to know how to do that. We're learning from the models and the uh, different companies, and we are developing uh, resources for other companies that want to make sure that they are operating those opportunities. We have an incredible amount to cover. I'm a person uh, with uh, an anxiety disorder, a learning disability, and ADHD, in case you can't tell. Um, I'm going to try really hard not to uh, not to yell at you guys, but uh, uh, it's hard for me because I have so much energy and I get really excited. And you guys get me excited because this is an awesome group of folks, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. And we're going to talk specifically about inclusion. And the reason that I think that we in the disability community, especially those of us who are neurodiverse, increase innovation, creativity, and new ideas is because we can't be assimilated into the group. Inclusion is defined as uh, when a person feels that their uniqueness is valued and that they belong as part of the team, right? If you don't feel that your uniqueness is valued and that you don't belong as part of the team, what's that? It's on the screen. <laughs> Exclusion, absolutely. But when you feel that your uniqueness is not valued, but you belong as part of the team, those are these kinds of teams where we walk and we talk and we do the same thing, and we, we've been doing it the same way for many, many years, but then you get a person on the spectrum who comes inside of that environment. You've been doing interviews the same way for the past 20 years and getting the same outcomes and the same people who are giving you the same products. And then you get somebody who's different who comes in there and all of a sudden it's a disruption. You can't assimilate them into the way that you've normally been doing things and that is what uh, leads to that innovation and creativity, all of the things that we as business want. Okay. So the, the catalyst for me is I had a job and my current employer, you know, everything that kept coming up saying you need to do this, you need to do that. After I was diagnosed, looking back was I was being coached to be less autistic, you know, and I was pushing myself so hard to be everything my employer wanted me to be because I thought it was my dream job. And in my life, you know, I may have a lot of social issues and I don't have a lot of friends, but I love the things that I do. You know, my tasks, my, my hobbies, those fill me up with so much um, joy. But, oh my gosh, I just like had an autistic moment and completely lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> what, please refresh to the Trip. Oh yes, yes, okay. So I started to have you know, some of us may or may not have heard of this before, autistic burnout. Um, and autistic people kind of online, we, we talk about autistic burnout. And I guess it would probably be a lot like burnout from anyone else, but we say it's burnout often caused by masking and trying really hard to push ourselves into the neurotypical box. Um, and it's just like uh, Dina was saying, it is extremely physically exhausting to be masking all the time, and it's also really detrimental to your self-esteem. Uh, and so I started to have physical neurological symptoms. I started to get sick. I was wasting away, and I was just so ill. And my doctor was out of ideas, and eventually she said, I think you have anxiety. I had actually read something online about an autistic uh, person, and it, it, you know, it, you, it clicks. If, it, if you're not autistic, it's not gonna click, but it really clicked. I couldn't let it go, so I asked, if I could see someone who had experience with autism. And you know, she said, I, I don't think you're autistic, but sure, sure. And so she gave me you know, the card for the local Autism Society chapter, and I called and specifically asked for people who had experience diagnosing autistic women and adults, because that is important, Dina was saying earlier, unless you have someone who really actually understands masking and adult women and adult diagnosis, um, you're gonna probably be misdiagnosed with something else. Oh, sure. These lights really are blinding. <laughs> I really hope this isn't a stupid question, but what would any of you who do mask say is the single big, biggest pressure, force, or reason that you do mask? I'm, will, I'm willing to take this one. I think the biggest reason, at least for me, is that there is so much stigma around autism and you so desperately want to be accepted. And I think we feel that we are accepting of each other up here, but that the rest of the neurotypical world isn't always accepting of us. And for many of us, it might've been because we wanted to avoid bullying. That was probably the biggest reason in childhood that I would mask, is how do you not get bullied? Whether, and for me, that was learning everything there was to know about the Twilight series in high school. 
and I couldn't care less about vampires. It was not my thing. I'd rather be playing Pokemon, but I would learn everything to know about it just so I wouldn't get bullied and I'd have what to say to my neurotypical peers in high school. So for me, it was always avoid bullying and you want to fit in and you also don't want to be seen as less of a person. Uh, I want to add too, because uh, going through school, you don't even know sometimes it's autism that you're being picked on for. I remember, you know, school in the 90s in Texas, a long time ago, okay, so hopefully it's not like this anymore, but I had teachers, you know, when I was getting bullied, and they wouldn't stop or interject, and when I tried to go to the teacher for help, she said, well, you know, if you would just act normal and stop being such a weirdo, the other kids wouldn't pick on you. So, masking is beat into us sometimes from a really young age, whether we're diagnosed or not. And so once I was diagnosed, I realized, and that's what really shook me up and made me realize I had to go out and start talking about this stuff, is that I subconsciously had been packing away and hiding all of the things about me that made me autistic. And at the end of the day, I would come home and could finally be myself, you know? But I, I don't, I try really hard not to mask anymore. Um, and be authentic, but it, it still isn't easy because you get weird looks from people sometimes. Like I, I think, you know, when I'm relaxed, I'm kind of visibly autistic. I'm always stimming, I'm always roaming, I'm not still. But I, if I need to go to a business meeting, I can put that away and not sit slackery. And, but I'm not comfortable and my brain is just focused on trying to be some way that's not organic to me the entire time and it just drains me. Um, like the masking part of it is like going to autopilot and I think part of the other component about being a woman is that you're trying to conform to you know conform to be what is to be a woman part of the masking is that and you're trying to conform to gender roles of being a woman so I think a lot of it has to do with that um, and that's sort of the baggage part of the baggage with this but it's sort of like um, Aside from like going to autopilot, like there's burnout that results from that too. Now, like since it's post-diagnosis, I'm more and more aware that there's going to be burnout. So I need to kind of just realize, oh, I'm just masking or I'm like doing too much. And maybe I should just leave early or, or kind of help mitigate that a little bit better. And now, because I'm a little more aware of it, or if I know I'm going to have a meltdown, I just take my keys, hand it over to somebody else, and they got a drive. So I just, I just make it more known externally what's going on, and now I'm, I feel a lot better when I do that. Great. Chandler, did you want to add any thoughts to that? Yeah, you want to say that? Although I was diagnosed at an early age with autism, I didn't really comprehended at the time when I was in grade school, middle school, and high school. I was being brilliant relentlessly during my education years. I couldn't really, I couldn't really figure out why. They were big enough to say we should share this with all other employers, public and private in America and around the world, and we should make it a universal thing. It is a big tent. I have seen the growth in the ideas that folks have expressed and, and accepted as I've been speaking here since the beginning. This year, for the first time, I saw several of you stand up and say, yes, John, I, I agree. I'm an autistic guy and I'm in management in my company and I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to come out and say, hey, I'm autistic and I stand as a role model for every other person in this company to be with me as autistic and neurodivergent in the workplace. That is a a huge achievement, folks, that we have done. And, and yet, I look at what we have here. We have a conference where we've invited thousands of people by saying the door is open to everyone and you can all come. There's no charge. We only have a couple hundred people here. And online, we have some folks saying this is great. And we have other folks saying, well, it's no good because they're not doing this and they're not doing that. And folks, you've got to tell people that the tent is big. If you think something else should be done in a small business or a big business or a nonprofit business, we are not running the one and only way to do this. But what we do have here is the one and only universally recognized brand that stands for our community and advocacy. 
And, and the final thing that I would like to offer you is when we started this, Jose announced with considerable pride that we have 60-some autistic people in attendance and we have 20-some autistic speakers here. So 10% of, of our attendees are autistic and speaking, and a rough, almost a third of our attendees are autistic. And that's, that, to me, is really good. So some people said to me, well, John, yeah, that's good, but it needs to be better. It need, what's it need to be? If you folks think that we're going to be running this thing with 80% autistic speakers and 80% autistic participants, who's going to be the rest of the community that's going to do this with us? The idea of neurodiversity is that we are a large minority in the population, but the fact is, we are a minority. And if we're going to be in this together, together means together. It doesn't mean just the minority. We need to all do this. And I think we've got a really good number here. And we need to recognize that it's not a failure that these other folks are not autistic. We need to recognize that it is a huge achievement that these are people who know and love autistic and neurodivergent people. And they believe in it so much that they had given up big chunks of otherwise tech careers where they were doing technology things instead of advocating for humanity. And they're doing it because we believe in it and they believe in it. And we just gotta put that in perspective. And, and I urge you, when you go out and talk about this conference, tell everyone that the door is open. And if you come here, this is the place that you are going to meet people and you're going to have conversations. And, and this person or that person can have a collaboration with you that can change your lives. That isn't going to happen with 140 characters online. It's going to happen here. And I just urge you to spread that word and, and to recognize that this is for all of us to make. It is not for someone to tell us. And when Jose says, well, we need a system of governance, absolutely we do. But that includes autistic people, neurodivergent people of all kinds, and non-autistic people, because that's what diversity is. It's everyone. It's not just us. Uh -huh. So with that, I guess I'll go back to... Your, your next, uh, what do I do now? Who's going to do that? Okay, you, you got When you have a summit that focuses on autism at work, many people just immediately go to, whether it be the corporate perspective or this type of industry jobs, but also understanding opportunities for individuals that are in the arts, and that, that creates a, 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 an awareness that they can contribute in so many other factors is really important to the diversity within the talent that we have here that was presenting everywhere, everyone from Dr. Shore to um, Jack Rosen and, and John and just what they actually contributed was tremendous to my experience yet again. Thanks, Jamel. I'm really encouraged by, uh, you know, I've attended several of these and over time I'm encouraged by a couple of things. More and more attendance by people on the autism spectrum more and more dialogue around that intersectionality that autism is only one dimension of the person. Uh, and also, we're getting better, I think, in putting these together and hearing perspectives from parents, from people on the spectrum, bringing them into panels. I think that's, that's hugely important. And I know among this team and other employers, we're trying to make sure that as we, as we shape the 2.0 versions of our program, that the voices of those people are also incorporated to help us take our next steps. So thank you all for, for sharing your perspectives here. Okay, I'm here. I have made it to terminal, whatever, C4. I'm waiting for my plane and I am so tired. It has been the most wonderful whirlwind of a few, three days. I haven't even processed so much of it, but there have just been so many great conversations and it's just been really amazing and lots of good things to come. Uh, I'm, I'm excited by how far we have come, but I'm a little intimidated you know, by just how far we still have to go. Uh, but, you know, we're getting there. 
Alright guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me on this adventure. I will talk to you next time.